Just a note on the final hymn. We shall be singing John Bunyan's words, Who Would True Valor See? And these are the original words with Hop Goblins and so on. We will sing them in the feminine gender. There's no discouragement shall make her first relent, her first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. There is a special reason why we will do this. Nicholas has found that Sally was a supporter and subscriber to the movement for the ordination of women. The movement used to sing Bunyan's words in the feminine gender. And it is particularly appropriate to do so on this occasion and in the week when the Church of England finally decided to approve that women can be bishops of which Sally will also surely approve. So we meet today to give thanks for a remarkable woman, journalist, academic, anthropologist, friend and colleague. Sally Childer, student at Somerville, principal of LMH. As we remember and give thanks, we commend her into God's gracious keeping. Nicholas will now say a special word of thanks. Nicholas. The booklet is in fact uh, something to which my contribution has been limited to uh, delivering it to LMH in various forms. Uh, the thought was that of Sally's first cousin, Lucia, uh, and uh, Lucia and I jumped into a car about six years ago one night to drive to Oxford. We did that because Sally was in hospital and she was about to die. Being Sally, she didn't. Uh, but at that stage, there was a serious problem. Sally would be the first to disclaim the idea that she had any problems, and if I said that she had two and a half serious physical problems, she would in the end have given up when we agreed on two and a quarter. Uh, the last half was that her hearing became very intermittent. It was absolutely perfect if one mentioned the word Cameroon, because then it would switch off. For that part, there were very serious problems, and it was, to my way of thinking, absolutely remarkable that she was able to live at home and die peacefully at home, six years on, uh, from when she came out of hospital, having added to other problems the fact that she could no longer walk. That she did so uh, was due particularly to a small group of people uh, who were devoted to her care. And it is they who I wish to thank now publicly. Paula Heger had been looking after the house for a long time. She loved Sally, and Sally loved her. And, and Paula went on doing that. Outside, there was occasionally a wonderful blaze of, of colour as the colours would be changed by David Campbell, who produced wonderful pictures in the garden. It would always be just one colour, so that through the blue haze, which was all that Sally could see, she could actually see something bright. And then inside the house, there was care 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Obviously, over the years, 
a number of people were involved. There were three who were particularly uh, long uh, uh, in the House. They did very, very long stints. Uh, two of them are in South Africa, and indeed that is where Paula is today because the relationship is such that they are all friends and I, Paula, goes uh, to South Africa uh, to see them. Uh, Leonie Murray and Annelise Van Zyl. The third of those who stayed for a long time is with us today, Nadia Doris. All of them made Sally's life possible, but they did much more than that because they all loved her as though she were her own mother. She loved them as though they were her daughters. And picture the scene in the last 48 hours of Sally's life. Most of the time, she was in cracking form. She was in the John Radcliffe about a month before she died, and uh, for 24 hours, uh, we thought she was going to die there and then, because she appeared to be completely unresponsive. Naturally, the moment came when she perked up, and the young consultant was suddenly faced with a patient who seemed exceedingly well, and wished to discuss with her the ways in which she herself should be treated, and indeed every other patient in the hospital should be treated. <laughs> but her back went uh, Sally, and the moment came when uh, she went badly downhill. I last saw her on a Monday afternoon, and it was a very, very difficult afternoon for her. Ian saw her on the Tuesday afternoon, and it was very difficult. It was Annalise then who was in post, and that evening she thought, as so often, poor Sally, what can I do for her? So she went to the CD collection, and she got out the CD of Robert Graves reading his own poems, and she put it on the CD player. If you want the perfect way to end your life, it is with the love and care of someone who does something like that. And so that the last male voice you hear is that of your uncle reading his own poetry. To those people I have mentioned, and to Estelle van Dijk, who uh, was the, uh, the person who set the scene because she organized all the care, so that it never failed over six years, I say thank you. I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man can see what God has prepared for those who love us. We sing with him, guide me, O thy great redeemer.
two poems by Robert Graves. Flying Cricket. The butterfly, a cabbage white, his honest idiocy of flight. Well, never now, it is too late. Master the art of flying straight. Yet has, who knows so well as I, a just sense of how not to fly. He lurches here and here by guess, and God, and hope, and hopelessness. Even the aerobatic swift has not his flying crooked gift. Leaving the rest unsaid. Finney, apparent on an earlier page, with fallen obelisk for colophon, must this be here repeated. Death has been briefly announced, and to die once is death enough, be sure, for any lifetime. Must the book end as you would end it, with testamentary appendices and graveyard indices? But no, I will not lay me down to let your tearful music mar the decent mystery of my progress. So now my solemn ones, leaving the rest unsaid, rising in air as on a gander's wing at a careless corner. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, 
in honour, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but can condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto the wrath. For it is risky, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. For wisdom, the designer of all things, 
has instructed me. For within her is a spirit intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, incisive, unsullied, lucid, invulnerable, benevolent, shrewd, irresistible, beneficent, friendly to human beings, steadfast, dependable, unperturbed, almighty, all surveying, penetrating all intelligent, pure and most subtle spirits. For wisdom is quicker to move than any motion. She is so pure, she pervades and permeates all things. She is a breath of the power of God, pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. So nothing impure can find its way into her. For she is a reflection of the eternal light, untarnished mirror of God's active power and image of his goodness. Although she is alone, she can do everything, herself unchanging. She renews the world and generation after generation passing into holy souls. She makes them into God's friends and prophets. For God loves only those who dwell with wisdom. She is indeed more splendid than the sun. She outshines all the constellations. Compared with light, she takes first place. For light must yield to light, but against wisdom, evil cannot prevail. The word of the Lord.
was born 100 years ago, on the 3rd of August, 1940. And she died on the 3rd of July this year, just one month before what would have been her 100th birthday. Her long life was rich in friendship, adventure, and intellectual engagement. A student here at LMH, where Sally was principal, recalls her remarking in an after-dinner speech to first-year students that the life of the mind can be lived on the edge of a packing case. I think that captures very well Sally Children's really striking combination of intellectual seriousness, her sense of living life on the move, and a somewhat bohemian style. Sally was the only child of Philip Percival Graves, foreign correspondent of the Times, and Millicent Graves, nay Gilchrist. She was born in Turkey, and throughout her life she travelled widely, at first through family circumstance, then personal choice, later after the Second World War on colonial office business, and increasingly for academic research in Africa, which became a lifelong commitment. She married Richard Childer, a classicist and civil servant, in 1937, a couple of years after graduating in modern history from Somerville College, Oxford. Psalm 121 in our service today was the psalm at their wedding service, and indeed also in her admission in this chapel to the office of principal in 1971. Richard predeceased her in 1985. Sally always spoke very fondly of her time at Somerville and remained in close touch with the college, where she was elected an honorary fellow in 1977. As a student, she thoroughly enjoyed ideas and conversation. She respected the erudition of Maud Clark and her other tutors at Somerville and other Oxford colleges, while also reveling in the range of their characters and, in some cases, their pronounced eccentricities. It was impossible for a politically aware student like Sally not to be involved in the great ideological debates of the early 1930s. And she plunged in with relish on the side of the left. Throughout her life, partly inspired by her uncle, Robert Graves, Sally was a writer. She wrote poetry. At some stages, she was, like her father, a journalist. And for several decades, from 1951, she produced important studies on Africa and especially the history and ethnography of Cameroon. Sally was also an administrator working in the Ministry of Economic Warfare and Officers of the War Cabinet from 1939 to 1944, and later in the Colonial Office and then the Institute of Colonial Studies at Oxford. It is not surprising, though it did surprise her, that she was invited to serve 
as principal of Bedford College, London, from 1964 to 1971, and I'm so pleased we have a representative of Bedford and its now linked with Ron Holloway uh, with us today. And similarly, it was not surprising, but Sally was surprised when she was invited to serve as principal of Lady Margaret Hall from 1971 to 1979. She also served variously as a trustee of the British Museum and a member of the governing body of the School of Oriental and African Studies. Ian Fowler will speak more about Sally's major contribution to anthropological research. I would like to offer some reflections on her time here at LMH. As it happens, I was an undergraduate entering my third and final year when Sally took over from another Somerville, Dame Lucy Sutherland, who had been a notable principal of the college for 26 years. A transition like that has its challenges. <laughs> we students noticed immediately a more informal style. Sally was unstuffy and a modernizer. She was rather shy, but kind and approachable, and we liked her snazzy trousers and the lively sherry parties she gave, for those were the days of sherry parties. I gratefully remember that she went out of her way to secure for me some additional funding for my doctoral research, even though I was undertaking it at St Anthony's College and not at LMH. She was always encouraging both to undergraduate and to graduate students, taking a genuine interest in individuals and their academic and personal concerns. Students who were here when she was principal wrote in with sadness after her death. And here are some of the things they remembered and wanted to share. An engaged and interested principal. She was pleasant and approachable, and it seemed to me there that under her leadership, the college was able to relax some of its more outdated rules while still preserving its best traditions and its strong academic focus. She was such a bravely independent thinker and always very stimulating company with the breadth of her anthropological perspectives. I feel lucky to have known her. On the two occasions that I had a face-to-face -face with Mrs. Chilburn, she really impressed me with her wry humour and her tolerance. I had extremely fond memories of those meetings and have never forgotten her. And the final one I've chosen to share with you. While maintaining discipline, she was flexible with us, understood each person's needs, and helped us with our tutors. <laughs> I don't know why students needed help with their tutors from the principal of the college, but clearly some of them felt they did. Sally's principal in precisely the years when the centuries-old tradition of single-sex colleges in Oxford gave way to co-residence. Her openness to that change, which she had already experienced at Bedford College, and her non-confrontational style helped LMH move swiftly and confidently to embrace co-education in 1978, when many of the men's colleges, but only one of the other women's colleges, St Anne's, also chose to do so. And in that very same year of 1978, 
1978. LMH also celebrated in style the centenary of its foundation. It was then an appropriate moment to celebrate the past and to look to the future. Here is a tribute from a student who did not know Sally, but understood the historic significance of what she had affected. I was among the first intake, 1981, into an LMH where no undergraduate had known it as a single-sex college. I was also among the first men to have benefited from Mrs. Childers' innovation, and I wholeheartedly thank her for it. Sally Childers lived longer than any other head of an Oxford college has ever done. She was creative, clever, kind, original, tolerant, and learned. She was also a most generous benefactor to Lady Margaret. For everything she achieved, and everything she contributed to all of us over a long life, we give thanks. Sally was born a little inconveniently the day before the First World War broke out, on the wrong side of the fence, so to speak. And the family had to flee, and before they were whisked off to Alexandria, and as her mother, Millicent, hurriedly packed, her father, Philip, rushed to the British Embassy in Constantinople to register the birth. In his haste, he forgot the names. He forgot the names that had been agreed with Millicent, Millicent Sally's mother. The registrar calmly suggested the child be named after her mother and grandmother's. And so she became Elizabeth Layla Millicent Rex. Layla being very well kept secret. <laughs> Sally Graves spent her early years following her father between England, Greece, and Turkey. She liked to joke that an early claim to fame was being sat on the knee of T.P. E. Lawrence. <coughs> she was immensely proud of her father. He notably exposed the notorious anti-Semitic tract, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, as a plagiarised copy of a pamphlet on quite a different topic. Following graduation from Somerville in 1935, she went with her mother to Germany. The mother Millicent thought Sally better go and look up her German re relatives, her German step relatives, before the war she predicted broke out. They were in Berecht's garden when Millicent, bitten by an insect, succumbed rapidly to septicemia and died within a few days. Sally returned to look after her father, her father for some months. He then went on to spend the winter of 1935 bravely travelling <coughs> alone, by bus and sometimes on foot, through the Middle East, passing through Jerusalem, via the Lebanon to Damascus, and back to Cairo. From there, she went to join her father in Turkey, and they soon found themselves travelling on a train to Algeria. The train stopped suddenly in the middle of a field. 
They were a little wary of the coups and counter coups that were going on at the time. And were mildly alarmed when a ladder was put up against the door of the carriage they were in. The man with six fingers on each hand entered and announced that His Majesty is waiting at the bottom of the ladder. The king, who incidentally had been driving the train, was a butterfly collector, as was Sally's father. Literally kidnapped off the train, they spent a few pleasant days butterfly collecting with the king of Bulgaria. She had an extraordinary life, an extraordinary beginning. It was in her mid-twenties that Sally first came into contact with Cameroon when recruited to the new section of the War Cabinet Office that dealt with the strategic overview of trade with the overseas territories of France and Belgium, of which Cameroon was one. Later, she became immersed in the ideas of the founding ancestors of British anthropology as temporary principal and secretary of the Colonial Science Research Council. And it was there she first encountered the Australian anthropologist Phyllis Cable, who was to become her close friend and collaborator. Hitherto office bound, Sally felt keenly the lack of direct field experience. So she joined Phyllis in 1958 in the grass fields of British Cameroons. They had a somewhat adventurous time. And Sally used to recount how on their way to Atop, a community with which she was later to, to develop deep ties, she and Phyllis stopped the barricade along the way by a group of men from Balasin, one of the local kingdoms. The men demanded they halt their journey come to the palace of drinks and to write down their local history. Sally's death is to be celebrated again in Kumbo, the capital of Insol, in March of next year, and hopefully I will be there to fire my own Dane gun in salute. Further field trips to the grass fields with Phyllis took place in 1960 and 63. The welcome outcome of their endeavours was their joint publication in 1968, Traditional Bemenda, a foundation work on the ethnography and history of the region. Sally went on to publish wide, widely in the fields of ethnography, and political and economic history. But sadly, Phyllis, Phyllis Cabry, died in 1977. And two years later, following her own retirement, Sally picked up the baton and began to revitalise the academic network Phyllis had built up, out of which now emerged the Grassfields Working Group, with an enthusiastic but informal membership spread over three continents that has held meetings in France and in Oxford and in Cameroon. Sally's small house in Oxford on the edge of Jericho was to become an informal research centre as she worked indefatigably from dawn to dusk daily, transcribing and indexing both her own field notes and Phyllis's. The latter written in a spider store, only Sally had decided. She combined these into sets of working notes and her output encompassed commentaries, exceptions, and epitomies of a broad range of published and unpublished texts, including very useful translations of early German archival documents. All these materials she dutifully and regularly distributed widely amongst the growing community of grassfields researchers. For almost three decades, her sitting room with its huge table typewriter and notes piled high was a mecca for Cameroon students coming to the UK and for researchers new and old going to the glass fields who were always welcome for the glass of fine red wine and the warm fog of smoke from her menthol cigarettes. In her later years Sally continued to publish 
The last major volume published in 2001 was on Max Esser and the economic foundations of the German colonial state of Cameroon. It was written together with Professor Uta Röschenthal in the Bergmann series, the Oxford Bergmann series, Cameroon Studies, of which Sally was series editor. And in 2009, she contributed a chapter to Feshre, dedicated to her very good friend and fellow Cameroonist Shirley Arden, who's with us today. Uh, one story, one final story from courtesy of Nick. When about this time last year, Sally's annual subscription to the Oxford Association for the Blind Club Jew, Sally cheerfully decided that it was time to update to life membership. <laughs> Sally Chilbert was a woman of immense personal and intellectual magnetism, and all of us fortunate and fortunate enough to be drawn into her orbit will be forever grateful. Let me close with the words, some words from the noted French anthropologist Jean-Pierre Barnier, written shortly after her death. Sally has written a trace on an innumerable number of persons. Those traces are still alive and enduring with each and every one of us. If you add up all those traces together, they come to something or somebody that is an enduring and living Sally. In a sense, she is still around, so to speak, simply delocalized. Thank you. Please kneel or sit for the prayers. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O eternal God, the resurrection and the life of all who believe in thee, who are always to be praised, as well in the dead as in the living, we give thee hearty thanks for thy servant, Edward Stuart Talbot, Bishop, our founder, Elizabeth Wordsworth, our first principal, and Elizabeth Chilver, principal from 1971 to 1979, and all others by whose liberality and service we are here brought up to godliness and the studies of good learning, beseeching thee that we, well using all these thy blessings to the praise and honour of thy holy name, may at length, together with them and all thy servants departed this life, be brought to the immortal glory of the resurrection, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Vouch safe, O Lord, to prosper with thy blessing the work of this college, dedicated to thy glory and the good of thy people, and grant to those who teach and those who are taught here, that being enlightened by thy truth, preserved by thy fear, and abounding in charity, they may daily advance in wholesome learning and in the knowledge and likeness of him who is the way, the truth, and the life to whom, with thee and the Holy Ghost, three persons and one God, be all honour and glory, now and forevermore. Amen.
into the world in peace. Be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one who will for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest on you and remain with you always. Amen.